Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for... Alper. And it's time for a... Alper, what are you doing? You know, would it have killed you to go along with that for just a little? Yes. Well, now that my cover is blown, I guess I should explain. Today's interview subject is so super amazing that I wanted to pretend to be a much more popular online content creator as I hoped it would get a bigger audience, but only because I am psyched to have him on the channel. He recruited all the original artists, um, and his art and art direction shaped the first few years of Magic's history from 1993 to 2000. Ladies and gentlemen, the mythic legend himself, Jesper Mirfers. Meeting you, so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's my pleasure. Okay, so the early years, what, what did you do what did you do for work before Magic the Gathering? I mean, I know that you grew up in a uh, family that embraced science fiction, but what were some of the jobs that you did before you were an art director? Because you were pretty young when you started. I, I've, uh, I, most of the time I spent in working in bookstores. I That's worked at the... B. Dalton and I worked at Tower. Oh, wow. B. Dalton. That takes me back. My first real art gig was painting 15 millimeter Napoleonics for a wargaming group. Really? Yeah. Huh. Now, I heard that you used to see Bill Gates in your bookstore. Is that true? It is. And it how, is. how did you know that he was Bill Gates? I mean, I guess he probably was already famous back then. How do you not then? know it's Bill Gates? Well, he'd I mean, up in a red Ferrari and come in oh. and buy his naughty magazines, and then he'd leave. Shut up. He did? Oh, yeah, that's... he did. Yeah. I sold Bill Gates porn. That's my other claim to fame. <laughs> Well, that's um, that is that's quite a claim. And for those of you who might be upset that I'm outing this, there is no bookseller client privilege that I'm aware of. Oh well, anybody who's upset about that, then they can just sit and spin because that to me makes a good interview. So, so tough, tough for them. And besides, you know, porn these days, ooh, you know, yeah, controversial, right? <laughs> shocking, shocking. But um, actually, um, so I what I would like to know is um, how did you like? What was, I know that the story behind you was that you were, you were at the corner school and you had, that's where you sort of did all your recruiting, but I want to know about the very first time you ever played magic. Where were you? Who was it with? And give me the experience. I was downstairs in Peter Atkinson's basement working on Talus Lanta, I believe, or maybe it was one of the Primal Order books, but they've been very hush-hush about the secret project they had going. And they wouldn't tell me because I was the new guy. Mm -hmm. But after they made me art director for the, for the other books, they uh, called me upstairs one day and said, okay, we're going to let you in on the secret. And they sat me down on a card table with, I believe Richard was the one who showed me with the little alpha cards. And we played the game and I was blown away. It was everything I wanted in a game. And the one thing you have to remember is back then, unlike a lot of the ways corporations run today, Every single person at that company was a gamer, and we were designing games for ourselves, knowing that the public of gamers would like it if we liked it, because and we you were just, hardcore gamers. And you just said to them, I don't want to be paid. I want stock, and that's sort yep. of like – I did. It's a smart decision, I would say. Yeah, I knew and it was going to change gaming forever. Now, when did you, when was the first time, I know that in a matter of weeks, the game took off, but when was the first time that you were like, oh my God, I'm actually famous from this? I have never liked to view myself as famous. I am a gamer who works on games and does artwork. I, the idea of celebrity really creeps me out. Why is that? Because I've seen how celebrities act. Right. But there are well-behaved celebrities, I think. There are, but also to embrace celebrity, it, it just doesn't feel right to me. It, there's something creepy about it. I hear you. I mean, I think that because of people like, say, the Kardashians, they've sort of hijacked what a, like a celebrity used to be, like the word means to celebrate. There used to be like, uh, you know, you needed talent or, uh, you know, a skill to, to become a celebrity. These days, it's not really the case. And so maybe when I say that I consider you a celebrity, I mean, it's because you are to be celebrated. You're somebody who is I worth celebrating. I appreciate that. And I like that people celebrate my artwork. That, that makes me really happy. 
And um, one of the things that I'm sure that you, you know, have noticed over the years, and one of the things I'm curious about is, is um, what are some of the most, like, as if, like, you've probably read stories about yourself. What are some of the most, like, embellished stories that you read that you were like, oh, my God, this is total crap. Like, what is this? The Nation magazine did a story on magic claiming that it was the two. It, what, the Nation didn't say this. They interviewed two busybody housewives from New Jersey or New York. Nothing, not that there's anything wrong with being a housewife, but there is something wrong with being a busybody. And they were religious zealots, of course. This was the tail end of the satanic pen when, when everyone without a real worry had to make something up. They said that the game was the tool of the devil. Every piece of art rec was tied to devil worship and that the company, i.e. me as the art director, knew exactly what we were doing. That's the most outlandish thing I've ever heard. And was that before or after you did The Dark? Because I love it. It was after. I wrote The Dark actually to kind of slap back at those kind of people. I thought so, because The Dark has such a great, um, like, uh, it has such great allegory to it. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely meant to attack that um, rabid evangelical mindset. And yeah, like, well, cards, like, you know, like, you the, the cards the art directed, like, like, Preacher, and of course, you know, the ones I, your own. Sh- I really tried to show the dark side of what white, which everyone considers to be good. Mm-hmm, That's what I mm-hmm. try to do in its sort of fascist overtones and, and theocratic overtones and the wanting to control and condemn that. That was really the focus of that set. And that's a that's a sort of take that it I think that in the modern day uh, age of gaming, they probably wouldn't even allow because it's so uh, oh, sensitive. No. God, no. No, they wouldn't allow that. I also didn't advertise the fact when I wrote it, right? It's not like I told everyone, hey, look what I wrote. I just, that was my intention behind the set. I am sure Wizards of the Coast had no idea. Well, I mean, and at the same time, you know, like, that's what's, you know, it's there for people who can recognize it. And the, and the more I've read about it, you know, it seems the dark is a fan favorite and for good reason. There is something about it that has, has you know, some thought to it. Now everybody gets upset because they say it's not as you know, strong as the other cards, but you know, whatever. Well, there was there was a reason for that actually. The dark was written to offset some of what I considered to be broken design in the earlier set. So when it came out, I think it meshed really well with the rest of the card sets. But as it has aged, its purpose has become irrelevant in the in the flood of cards that have come after. So I, I can see why people think it's weak, except for Blood Moon. Mm-hmm. Well, and I mean, it's Season of the Witch. I mean, the one behind me has had a little bit of a, you know, a spike and for sure. And like, uh, there are a couple of cards that have, you know, skyrocketed. I know because they're reserved, but they're also pretty, they're pretty heavily used in a lot of um, decks that I've been seeing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, like Season of the Witch, like out of nowhere, it skyrocketed to, it was up to, uh, I think, 100 dollars something you know per card and i cracked one I, I i went on i went and bought myself a, a dark pack and i i cracked one and i was very happy but yeah the actual single packets are going for like 190 dollars per pack the other reason I, I designed that set is because i and a bunch of the artists wanted to do creepy art and so i thought if we had a set that was kind of creepy we'd all get our our chance at it um, I read in the interview that you said that one one of the regrets that you had about the original sets was that you didn't get a chance to work with artists that you you had wanted to, and in a sense that you didn't want to necessarily. You're not speaking ill against any of the ones you used, but you wish you could have brought in more artists. Yeah, that's that's true. I, I'm really happy with the artists I worked with, and it's been fun to watch them grow over the years. Who would be some of the artists that you had in mind that maybe you didn't get a chance to work with? And did you ever get a chance to make that up in further sets? Well, one of them is my painting instructor at Cornish, who taught Amy Weber and Sandra Eggerving and myself, named Preston Wadley. Uh-huh. And I really wanted him. He, he, he was such a major influence on all of us and such a great instructor. And I wanted him to work on the set, but he turned me down politely. And it, it might have been because it was a conflict working for a student. I don't know because I was still in college at the time. Really? But I wow. really regret him not working on the game. So and, uh, you, were, you were still in school when the game started? Yes, wow. I was. And by the way, I watched your interview, the first part with Julie Barrow. It was oh, really yeah. interesting. And Julie wasn't lying about the head of the design department. She was awful. Yeah. Yeah, she yeah, would have I... kicked me too if I weren't on the dean's list. 
She, I don't know so if you, she got along with anybody. See, she seems like she was just straight up unpleasant then. Unpleasant, condescending. She knew everything. Nobody else knew anything. The, the people who were there to kiss her butt got along really well with her. But I think history bears me out because she was replaced before I left the school. I mean, and that's so funny. It's the funniest thing I've met. A lot, I've talked to a lot of you guys and a lot of a surprising amount of you guys were doing these uh, cards while you were in school. And, and, and even there are some modern magic artists today who still are getting, if not backlash from teachers who they're working under, uh, they're not getting any support. And it blows my mind. You'd think in an art school that if there was something like that happening, that they would be all for it. They don't understand it. I mean, the, the what I heard most often work, uh, going to school was there's no such thing as a fantasy art market. The best you could hope for is doing album covers or book covers, and you would have to move to New York or California to do it. They were completely ignorant of the, the fantasy gaming scene and the were emerging there, video game scene. Were there any that ever came up to you in a later date, came up to you and said, hey, I, you know, do you remember me? I was wrong. I wanted to apologize, maybe say you were oh, right. There was nothing to apologize for. They were doing their best. They were trying to guide us into what they thought would be a viable career. So there was no apology necessary. Right. OK, maybe not apology, but maybe just maybe yeah, came up I, and I said. I did hear later that that I was right and they were wrong. That's nice because, you know, it's it always it, it shocks me that there is you'd think that with you know, there's things that I don't know about. I mean, like I like these days, like TikTok and whatnot, or schmick schmock. I don't know what's going on on it, and I don't care to. But I'm not gonna, you know, say to somebody you can't, you know, do something on that platform because I don't know anything about it. Well, it's heavily owned by the Chinese government, so I wouldn't advise going on it. Well, that's probably why I wouldn't go on it. Plus, you know, nobody wants to see me dancing to pop music. It's just not necessary. Or maybe they do. You could <laughs> maybe a sensation. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, that would be a that would be a real kick in the balls. And at, at the same, like I'd be like, oh, trying to make a success of myself, and then I blow up on TikTok. Now, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was your writing. Uh, you have you have written. Have you um you talked about how you were writing a novel? Has the novel been finished, or is it something it, that's ongoing? No, it's finished. I so, just need to get it edited. Okay. Okay. I'm not so, doing that myself because that that's um, a. That's a fool's errand right there. There's that's impossible to do. I edited a, a book and I, I was I wrote one of the short stories in it. And it's that's a lot of work. That would be like art directing and then creating your own set of magic at the same time. You probably just end up eating your own you know, head. Just it's too much work. And oddly, it's not a fantasy novel. It's it's um kind of a it's a comedy of errors set in the 90s with a little bit of magical realism in it. Interesting. So, um, can, I mean, is are you allowed to give away anything, or do you not yeah, want to? Yeah, sure. It, it's called Mr. Brown, and it's about a paranoid man who probably has some other mental issues as well, based heavily on myself. And not that I'm paranoid. I just I I took some of my stranger thinking and moved it into into this character. And it's about how his delusions influence everyone around him because they can't. They don't see it as delusion and they're trying to rationalize why this stuff is happening. And so they get it blown way out of proportion. And it's how he sort of weaves through these people's lives on the fringes, but has a major impact on their personal lives. Nice. OK, yeah, that sounds interesting. Well, you know, it's I very mean, silly. So you got it's more of a, like it's got a bit of a comedic side to it. Hopefully it's a comedy book. Well, I mean, I mean that's I, what I tried to write, but it's up to the <laughs> reader to decide if I did. Do you have any other uh, things that you uh, have in mind as far as stories that you'd like to put out? I mean, as it seems like, again, with your going back and looking at what you did with the dark, there is a writer inside of you, I think, or obviously well, I've, there I've is. I've also written a book of short, short stories called Bus Stop about a kid who rides the bus every day. Not a school bus, just a regular bus. And it's little one paragraph stories about how he sees the world. Mm -hmm. Also heavily influenced by my own writing and the weird thing is I always thought that the main character was autistic and I based him on me and I found out a few years ago that I am autistic I went and and to the University of Washington to their autist autism labs and got all the tests and sure enough I was 
And how do you, I mean, did, how did you go to figure that out? I mean, did somebody say to you, hey, maybe you might be um, somebody who's neurodiverse or how did that <laughs> well, happen? Not that politely. My wife many times told me that. <laughs> and at first, you know, I thought there's no way. But the more I looked into it, the more I started to see myself. I like the fact, too, that you talk about there are, there are positives of having the having that neurodiversity that you that you found in your life that have, have aided you and what some of those were, if you wouldn't mind talking about them. Yeah, it, it is sort of a latent superpower. It, it allows for incredible focus in things that I'm interested in. I mean, I forgot who it was, but there was a, a software company where the president said he really liked to hire autistic people because he could work them harder because they were more focused, which is a crappy thing to do. But I mean, that is true. Autistic people really are focused on things they're interested in. And right. of course, it's, it's, a, it's a spectrum. So I can't speak for everybody. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'd like to think I'm pretty high functioning. So I, I can only speak for autistics my age who are me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, there you go. I mean, and you certainly can speak about that because you are you. And uh, so, okay, this might be, a, this might be a, a gauche question, but the, the game comes out, the stock is obviously very well. And I actually read that there was somebody who turned down the stock and was basically mocking you guys. And you said, and how yeah. much? Yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, going to mention names. He owned a good percentage, like probably a percent or two. And he sold all the stock for $9,000, mm -hmm. bought a new car stereo, pulled up outside the office with the stereo blaring and mocked us losers for still holding on to the worthless stock before he drove off. Ooh, yeah. Uh, it's a big foot and mouth moment, I'd say. It is a big foot and mouth. I, I still think about it and smile. He he sort of deserved it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it, life certainly, I mean, that's that, if, if one were to believe in karma, that would be a pretty big spanking. It was karma. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, who does that? Who who gets, who, bla it's like out of a, it's like out of a 1980s, like movie where the jock comes up and is like, hey, you douche, you know, like something like that. It's just very, kind of very astute observation. Yeah, it's like what? Who does that? Is it? It's very. It's very. Uh, it was childish. That's for yeah, sure. and flamboyant. It's <laughs> funny. <laughs> yeah, it's funny for you guys. So, uh, speaking of funny, I'd love to know: Do you have any funny memories of your time in Peter Atkinson's basement? Any hmm. times where you might have laughed so hard you you almost peed or something like that? Because I did ask Anson Maddox who had the worst gas out of all of you. And he didn't want to say who the name was, but he said, let's just say it was the janitor. And I think uh, he's, I think he, we know who that might be. Yep. Uh, you know, there were lighthearted moments and we certainly had our chuckles, but it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. We were a very small team and it, printer deadlines are, are not very negotiable once they're set. So it was a lot of nose to the grindstone kind of work. We listened to a lot of music and stuff, but and we so, didn't oh, sorry. josh around all that much. No, okay, yeah, I guess so because the work was just so like demanding, and you were working some crazy amount of hours, uh, I, something ridiculous, right? Yeah, before I quit, I was working twenty-hour days. And how do I, you how do you do that? You don't. That... You don't. That's I, I had a breakdown over that and quit. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you'd, ha yeah, that's sort of, that that has to happen because the body can only take so much, you know, punishment. Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm older than the rest of the artists who I was at Cornish with. I didn't go back to college until I was 29. So I was a little bit older when I was doing all of this. Really? Okay. So you were 29, which is, I mean, it's a little bit older, but not terribly, I mean, not old by the I was in my 30s, I think, by the time magic came out like early 30s what brought you to school then so later on? i mean what was the what made you decide i'm just going to do this and in 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 that sort of period i mean it's great that you did i got fired from tower books for telling a customer what i thought of them a rude customer basically a male karen oh what do they what do they call turned out to be the friend and neighbor of the regional manager so I got Karen out of my job. And oh, no, I, that's funny. Oh my God. Uh, so you've, yeah, you, you definitely don't have any problem laying out the sass uh, and, and you know, that, that makes sense, especially with the way that you came to the defense of the artists. 
you were the way that you had set things up in the very beginning was something that you don't really see in any sort of uh, corporate or company treatment of artists ever. And um, I commend you for that. Well, I mean, it was in my best interest. Not only am I an artist, I'm, I'm a huge fan of art and artists. And I want to see good artists and I want to see artists treated well. Like I said, I'm the end customer. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. I am not I am not an empty suit in a corporation looking to maximize everything. I, mm -hmm. I, I viewed it as, I wouldn't say family because that's a little tacky when it comes to a corporation, but I, I did view it as an artistic family. Mm -hmm. like I feel kinship to anybody who's an artist. Right, right. On some level, because we all share experiences that other people won't understand. There is a tightness. Sounds, there, Which the sounds community. pretentious, but that's mm -hmm. what it is. No, no, it doesn't sound pretentious. One of the things that I am fascinated and I find wonderful amongst all of the magic artists is that there is that sort of just tightness, tight knit, like kind of you're protective of each other, you support each other. There's not really any of like animosity that say is the way it is and say like with a group of writers where there is a lot of like, you know, sniping and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I never saw that. When I was doing art in the in the game industry, all, all the artists, for the most part, were friends. We all passed jobs around. If we were too busy and we, we recommended someone who we thought would be good, we encourage each other. It, it's always been very, very friendly. It's friendly competition when there is competition. Right. So for like now, OK, it's another gauche question, but I wanted to know what what is one thing that you got with your magic money? That maybe was a crazy, like you spent a lot of money on it and maybe it was not, you know, it's not something you had to have, but it was something you got and that you're really super proud of. Like I read that you said you had a handwritten H.P. Lovecraft poem. Yeah, it's sitting right next to me here. Let's see if you can see it. Probably a lot of glare. Wow. I also have some uh, Lovecraft letters to Clark Ashton Smith. I have uh, two record albums owned by Jack Kerouac that have postcards with them that describe him buying them. Uh, so that I, he bought them and then wrote a description of him buying them? Yeah, or? He bought them and mailed them to his girlfriend or was bringing them to his girlfriend. So he wrote her postcards describing, like, I got the My Fair Lady soundtrack and I'll be bringing it up next time I see you. And mm -hmm. now I own that copy of My Fair Lady. You know, it. it's cultural artifacts mm -hmm. from the hands of creators I admire or people I admire. So I picked up a lot of things like that. And they were, a lot of them were surprisingly inexpensive, not the Lovecraft or Kerouac, but HG Wells, I got a postcard from him. I have something from almost every one of the beat writers. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, Queen Victoria, uh, Lord Wellington. Wow. I mean, have you Huey ever thought P. about- Long? Have you ever thought about maybe like photographing them and doing some sort of like, I don't know, like, oh, you could do like a collection, uh, like sort of like an online museum almost because it seems I, like I posted got... them on Facebook. Oh, from time wow. To time to let people it's, see them. I, I also, I would... the thing I'm proudest of, though, is I bought an unpublished photograph of H.P. Lovecraft surrounded by cats that the collector who owned it before me said he paid for it. So no one else was going to see it. And I bought it and released it into the wild. Nice. Oh, that's nice. That's good. You, yeah, you, you're a fire starter a little bit there. H.P. Lovecraft, he's so talented. It's a shame he had such demons. It's a shame he was a racist is what it is. Well, yes, like, that, that would be I the word. I really like the, the ideas he came up with. And I admire his scientific bent. But given that scientific bent, he shouldn't have been a racist. Yeah. That, that, there's nothing scientific about that. And I'm not going to make any apologies for him either. He made his bed. He can lie in it. He had some good ideas, and I admire those a great deal. But, you know, he's a flawed person. Right, right. He is. And that's one of the reasons that I think, I mean, it, it's clear that he had his, he had problems that were not th something that people were going to be able to fix. He, he was, he was tortured in his own way. And I think that that was a it spill off of it. it does not make it does not excuse it but he was just like a deeply unhappy person i think i think so too yeah and a lonely I mean, one 
And you'd have to be with that kind of mindset. And, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the things also that I wanted to talk about was, um, and I, to clarify it for people now, when the banning of Invoke Prejudice happened, you were very vocal about what it was actually supposed to be about, which I, you know, I, if you are cool with dis discussing it, sure. we can if, okay. Because now the thing that's tricky and I think people don't get is that the artist Harold McNeil, um, a, and I don't know if he was at the time, he ended up becoming sort of a, uh, it, like almost like a Far third right. right. Yeah, kind of like fetishizing Hitler. Now I'd imagine that wasn't something that came up in the, you know, art direction room. Like you can't find that stuff out until later, right? Yeah, that's exactly the case. I found it out later. I, I also, I've met with Harold, of course, I've talked to him. I've even I've gone to parties that he's been at and he always came across as very thoughtful mm -hmm. and not a bigot. So I, I was very surprised to learn about his leanings later. Maybe he just sort of had a, I mean, that's the thing that happens where it, it's sort of um, people kind of disintegrate into these, these ways of thinking that just sort of change them. It's a shame because that maybe is not the person you remember them being. I don't, I don't know him very well and I never did know him very well, but like I said, I enjoyed his company. I found him to be very intellectual, but you know, I, I can't, like I said, I can't condone that way of thinking. It's, it's counter to the growth of humanity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you but can't what, have a good, you can't have a good society if you believe that kind of thing. I agree. But for the record, it, I wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind stating what the actual intention of Invoke Prejudice was, so people can have some historical context to it. Yeah, the the actual intention was the hoods were not clan hoods. They were hoods from the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And the inquisitors didn't wear them. They put them on the victims. But that's where that iconography came from. The fact that they looked like clan hoods wasn't lost on me, and I thought it was kind of fitting because screw the clan, right? right? right. So. I mean, yeah, uh, as, it as, wasn't as meant to paint. It wasn't meant to paint them in a nice, in a good light. Just like it wasn't meant to paint the Spanish Inquisition. And it, it was about intolerance. Mm -hmm. It's true, and you know, I think that what's interesting is that I feel like in Ixalan, I don't, I don't know how much you follow the modern game, but I think they they revisited that with the vampire conquistadors, and uh, it sort of is something that has been touched on again. So I, I feel like that the elements of it are something that I, I guess what's unfortunate is that when people who are able to get it, get it. But when you, I guess somebody who is not get, who gets it incorrectly, that's the problem, but you cannot blame art for a person's reaction to it, you know? Right. But as I said, when, when they made the announcement, if it was legitimately offending people because they misinterpreted it, it should have gone because the point wasn't to offend people, particularly not along those lines. Right. And my intention was, is irrelevant if it's being taken another way. That's an interesting statement. Uh, that's, that, uh, that's a very cool way to put it. I, I, I like that a lot. That's, that's, I'd have to, I'm going to have to think about that one because it's just, it's very well put. Um, with your painting though, and I'd say as an art director, you are obviously kicking ass. Um, as a painter, though, I've seen some of your artist proofs actually that are being revealed for our artist proof cube soon. And man, you have improved like astronomically. Yours are insanely good. I mean, it's, it's thank you, mind blowing. I mean, we got to I got to see uh, uh, elves of the deep shadow combined with I I, I wish I could remember it was a is a, a diptech. You did a couple diptechs and. It's uh, it looks like Innistrad uh, in one shot of Bad Moon, and then it was ah yeah, Will of the Wisps. That was the one where they lined up together, and they were just it, it's astonishing. Uh, how many how many how many hours a day do you paint? Uh, and and how how well, do you... I, working in the game industry burned me out on art, and mm -hmm. I was disappointed because I had a lot of shall we say subpar artwork out there that. It's going to haunt me for the rest of my life, basically. It doesn't matter if I was paid for it. It, it. it doesn't reflect well on me, I don't think. And I just kind of gave up painting for 18 years. Then people started to want paintings on artist proofs. And 
again, I had given up painting for 18 years and was really embarrassed by the results I was getting. So I decided to start taking it seriously. And I paint between four and six hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, that started to pay off. It's astonishing. I mean, I look at them and it's like, I, I when I do, my, like, I'm not, I guess I wouldn't be spoiling, but in the video, I, it was hard for me to say anything else, but this looks like a, like a, just a better version of, of what, you know, of what the old one was. And it's, it's true. It's, it's astonishing how you're uh, like, I mean, these, they're on these tiny cards and it's just like, it, it's like butter. It, it, it's beautiful. The, the other interesting thing about that is I am currently legally blind. Wait, what? Yep. I'm doing that detail legally blind. I don't know how, but I'm going in in October to get my retinas replaced and that should fix it. Do you, are, do you use like a, like a, like a, like a glass or so, like a looking glass or something? No, no. I just kind of, I, I paint in shape and color mostly. I mean, losing my eyesight has really helped me as an artist, as strange as that may sound, because yeah. it's changed the way I see things. Huh. And that has helped my painting. Wow. So, but, and, you know, I'm legally blind for things like driving, but if I hold something up to my face, you know, eight inches away, I can see it fine. So when I paint, I just do a lot of close checking. And, but the dexterity that needs to be there too. I mean, what I would be interested to see, like almost like a, it would be cool to see a live video of your actual painting process because it's, again, I say this to other people, but it's like the, the uh, 10 commandments on the head of the pin kind of thing. Where it's like, well, my how wife's does, even better at it than I am. Well, that's, that's, that's interesting. Now, how, how do you, t how do you two meet up? I mean, online it seems dating like, site. No way. Yep. Wow. That's like, that's, a, I mean, for me, it, it, that blows my mind. I'm like, wow, success story from online dating. Like that can happen. I've given up hope on that one for myself. I had given up hope. I had, I was logging on to close my account when I found a message from her and it clicked. So the rest that's, is history. That's awesome. And it's, uh, it's, it's great that it did. I'm, I'm good for you. Now, um, one of the things that I was curious about, and I didn't get a chance to really like see much of it, but the hills, the hills rise wild. What, what was that all about? I, I wanted to know more about that just because I was very curious to see what it was. It's kind of a tongue in cheek, Lovecraft based. How can I put this? It's sort of a tactical combat game that plays out like a sport. There's four factions. There were supposed to be five. That's a story I don't want to get into. But the idea is each of these factions is running around the backwoods looking through old cabins to find a copy of the Necronomicon that they can then bring back to their home base to destroy the world. And the first one to destroy the world wins. But the other factions, meantime, are, are also trying to find it, or if it's been found, are trying to intercept it. Huh. Right? So then it becomes like a game of football where they're trying to stop the, the, the one who has it from getting back to their base. Oh, yeah. It's uh, like, sort of like a kind of like a, a horror capture the flag, like almost. Kind of, yeah. Um, what are some of your favorite horror films, if uh, you don't mind saying? Because I, I love a good horror buff as being one myself. Well, Phantasm, the first one, uh -huh. is one of my all-time favorites. I, and the rest are pretty pedestrian. I mean, I really like The Thing. Do you think The Thing's pedestrian? I think a lot of people consider it one of the best horror movies made. So that's I was going to say, I was like, it's, I mean, for me, like when I think about like films like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Halloween, I mean, the, the, the vintage ones, but even there are modern day films like I think The Strangers or... Um, I, I think horror, I and mean, of course, Get Out recently has made horror now uh, something that is not to be ashamed. I am really particular. Oh, the original Dawn of the Dead is also one of my favorites. I oh, am so really good. particular about horror. I enjoy horror that expands the universe, that leaves room for things we don't understand. So like The Thing, Aliens, Phantasm, as I said before, mm -hmm. things that horror that makes you think. I really like. I do not like mean spirited mm. torture porn. Right. I right. really don't. If the goal of the film is just to watch like innocent people suffer, that's not horror for me. I, I can do it with the old slasher films because they're almost comedy at this point. They're so 
cliched, even though right. they set those standards. Mm -hmm. But it's 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 a good point. It's a fair point. And I think that that's the problem is that I think a lot of times horror, when you see the worst of the worst, it's so bad that you can't even begin to think that there are films that are uh, to be considered classics that I mean, that are must view as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah. The Void was really good. I enjoyed that film a lot. I really like Stranger Things because, again, yeah. it, it it broadens the universe. It doesn't make it claustrophobic. I love the idea that that um the uh, reason of the, well, the talking about aliens and the writing of aliens, that it was actually supposed to be sort of like an uh, uh, sort of um and then like the Shirley Jackson, I believe it's called. And then there was one the and it's sort of like the way they did it was like it's a haunted house movie, but it's in outer space. Right. Agatha Christie, wasn't it? I'm sorry. Yes. Agatha Christie. I'm sorry. Derp, derp. Dumb Most moment for me. Remember? Uh, yes. Yes. And also my failing, my, my, my failing brain. And I've just embarrassed myself, which, you know, maybe I'll cut it up, but you know what? I won't, because you know what? I need to be shamed for that one because I can't believe I screwed the two up, but they're both very good in my defense. Yes. I did not know that, uh, Shirley Jackson wrote the birds. Uh, and I didn't either. Yeah, have you, oh my God, it, you ever get a chance to read it? It's just a short story. It's only about like 50 pages long. It's fucking scary. And it's not, and not really, and not, there's traces of it in the Hitchcock film, but it's completely different than what you would expect. And you will, you'll feed it, you'll finish it. Like you'll be shaken when you read it. I'll have, I have it. I'll, I'll give it a read. Oh, it's so spooky. I read it in an airplane uh, and uh, it wasn't a good place because <laughs> you're like, OK, the birds could be coming at me now anytime. It's, it was it was terrifying. Um, now, as far as and I won't keep you much longer because I know you got paintings to do. But as far as I know that when you parted with Wizards, it was because at the time and this was the company at the time, they were not. They were just not what you would consider something that you wanted to be involved with as, as far as like- The on second a, on a, time. I left or, them twice. So the okay. second time that was the reason. So the, I'm sorry, the second time. So the second time it was because you, had, you were seeing things happening at the company that you found personally to be reprehensible. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was some bad stuff going on. This was before Hasbro bought them. So I can't comment on anything post Hasbro. Now, you have said though that you have- you admire that the, what they're doing today as far as bringing things like bringing diversity and and sort of being more responsible with the way that they treat people and their their audience in general correct yes so that being said is there any chance that you would ever return to magic uh with the stuff that's happening with secret layers and they're they're bringing back all of these you know vintage artists and uh, I, as a complete as a completist, I would love to see it. Is there any chance that we could see you return for a card? Uh, I or? would be. I would definitely be open to it. That would be amazing. And, and the reason really is the fans. I have heard so many of them ask that, and they're such nice people that I don't want to disappoint. It's. It would be great for you to do it because I feel like not only that, but you would get a chance to sort of. Uh, de-haunt yourself from what you feel like is not a representation of your work as an artist. And it's not, I mean, really, I cannot get over the, those were just like, they knocked me over. I, I, you know, me and my cameraman were like, well, thank wow, you. it's great stuff. I mean, it, the fact that they were also like done on cards that like one of them, I think was Scrublands and the other was like a, a it was, um, a Scrublands, I believe was one of them. And the other one was, they were just basically cards that I never anticipated touching in my life let alone touching them with this incredibly gorgeous artwork on it it was it was uh very stressful to even like to even move them i was like eh, eh, eh. yeah i to me they're all just cardboard because yeah, i was well. there at their at their inception but yeah i i see i see what you mean I, well, I'm i mean really i'm really thankful to the people who have hired me to do their the cards also because they've given me the freedom for the most part, to experiment and work beyond what my abilities were back in the day. I get a few that ask me to do an accurate recreation, and those are, to be honest, really painful because it feels like a huge step backwards. What was one of the most like fun magic-related commissions that maybe you're the most proud of or maybe a reimagining that you're the most proud of? I'm proud of a lot of my newer ones. 
to tell you the I mean, truth. Do you take do you take pictures of them or they they do you like keep them private for the people who have them commissioned? It really depends. Some people don't want anyone to see them and they're going to pass them on to their kids who can unveil them and other people, you know, host online meetings to show them off. So it really runs the gamut. Well, if you have any of them that you can think of that you would be open to sending me for this video, I would be like more than happy to show them. I'm curious myself because uh, again, I just wish people could, I would, I want people to see like how insanely good you've gotten. It's, it's, they're so good. And, and I, 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 I sound like, you know, I'm gushing, but I kind of am. I can't really help it. I appreciate it. I put a lot of work into improving, but I also know I have a long way to go and that's really exciting. I still feel like I'm making breakthroughs every time I pick up a brush. Do you do any personal work? Uh, I do. For yourself? Yes. And what, and what is that? What would be an example? Do you like maybe what, what drives you to do a personal piece? What's, what's something that has driven you like maybe an, a, an example of what you've done? I'm working on a project that I hope one day will come to fruition, which is a, sort of a fantasy travel guide that it's a bestiary. So it would mm. be various creatures that I've come up with. And a lot, a lot of my personal work goes towards that. I also have a book, a uh, handmade book that I do picture, uh, illustrations in when I want to get something out of my head and onto paper as full mm. paintings, not as sketches. I, I really don't sketch. Wait, I so go you straight do, to paint. Wow. So you like have a, say like, it's almost like a sketch journal, but it's a paint journal. Right. Wow. Um, With full paintings, no paint sketches. There. How, how does it, how do you get the pages to not like totally just like wrinkle or crinkle from all the, the paint or how do you, can you, do you just treat them or something? I, I put down a heavy layer of paint first and that ah. stops it from acting up. Now, are you going to, like, do you have, do you actually have any of your original like artwork from Magic that you, do you still have any of those? I have Witch Hunter and Elves of Deep Shadow. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. Like, yeah, Elves of Deep Shadow. My brother has Bad Moon. Oh, really? Bad Moon is, I mean, it's cool. It's cool. It's amazing. Those, those, uh, I feel like it's a, you know, it would be, it, what, what will happen to them? Uh, you know, like, is there going to be like, uh, like, I feel like, I wish there could be a magic museum where people could like tour the paintings that, of all these originals, you know? Yeah. A friend of mine bought nine or 10 of the originals when Alpha came out. So wow. he has those. That's a uh, good investment. Like, that's his kid's college fund, he says. Invent some. I'd <laughs> yeah, I, I would guess so. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, it must, it has to blow your mind, like the cost of the individual cards from Alpha that you see out there. I mean. Well, Black yeah. Lotus is obscene. I, I, that just is, blows my mind. I'm sure Chris would be very satisfied to see that. It's, he told me I once mean, that if he'd known it would be that popular, he would have put more work into it. <laughs> <laughs> but like it's insane i mean but it has the ability of what you guys your guys' stuff goes for it puts you in an echelon of with an echelon of painters like like picasso and whatnot you know like these people who can charge you know six digits for a painting it's it's that's surreal but you know hey if it happens well, i, it I happens. don't charge that much i try and actually keep my prices somewhat low because i know the people who admire my work aren't made of money right and right. I would rather have my art out there being looked at and enjoyed and talked about than holding out for the big money paintings, if that makes it's, sense. Mm -hmm. I, I get you. I understand. It's just, uh, but at the same time, you know, like I, I much respect for being able to even, like, even if you are able to ask for that amount, even, whether you don't charge it or don't charge it, it's a very cool thing to, to, to have be part of your, you know, just sort of life experience. And I don't think it's anything to be, you know, necessarily embarrassed or, or, or taken aback by i think it's cool and i think you are a celebrity whether you like it or not sir that is so strange to hear well yeah i can't help it you became a celebrity so it's your fault technically i mean you're the one who shouldn't become a celebrity I, I, i'm just saying it's like i said i am just a gamer who makes games and and paints Speaking right on which if you don't mind i i I, when I told you that I had been using Zoom before, I was working on a video game called Luna and the Moonling, 
which uh -huh. is available on Steam and hopefully will be coming out for other platforms soon. Oh, it's going to ask you that before I close out. I was going to say, is there anything that you wanted to announce? So it's um, going to be, what was the name of that again? Luna and the Moonling. I don't, you, know, remember, I don't remember if you know the old Super Nintendo game, The Adventures of Lolo. I do. Like, which is a block pushing game. Uh -huh. It's that, but with more complicated mechanics and much better graphics. I was the environmental artist on it. What does that mean, environmental artist? So they would hand me a level and it would just be blank squares with the paths traced out. And then I had to make it look like a place. So I put down every tree and rock and flower and all of that and, stuff. And, and so you do the, are you do, like you do computer, you program it in or is it something you, you did with paint? I did it and then, in Unity. I'm, I'm an idiot, what's Unity? It's a game engine. It's basic, I, I did the, so the art placement is, how can I describe it? It's a bit like a 3D app, except I wasn't doing 3D modeling. I was doing 3D placement, mm -hmm. resizing, shifting. I did. I think I made one of the models for it because nobody had what I was looking for. And we Ooh. had a really talented young guy who was just out of school who did a lot of the other modeling. Is that something that you you enjoy doing? Is is that is that uh, is how is that different? I guess is it less stressful to work on versus say like art direction? Because you're more like maybe focused and, and and isolated, or am I wrong on that one? I, I don't know. I haven't really given it much thought. My passion is video games. I mean, mm -hmm. the reason I got into doing artwork in the first place is because I wanted to make windows into other worlds that I and others could look through, right? And then when video games came along, I could not only make windows people could look through, I could make places people could walk around in, and that to me is really intriguing. What would be the, like, if you can name some windows that you've walked into by other creations, like creators, be it uh, artists, authors, what have you, what would be like two or three of the most influential ones for you in your life? Probably any book by James P. Blaylock. who's one of my oh. all-time favorite writers. He, he, he's friends with Tim Powers. Oh. Who wrote yeah. Stranger Tides that they made the, the pirate, Disney pirate movie out of. Really? Even though the book isn't a Disney pirate movie and came out decades before. He does, he writes, if, if Dickens wrote fantasy and, well, Dickens did write ghost stories, a lot of them, but he writes fantasy and ghost stories mostly. Really? And so like, uh, are they like uh, short novels, long novels? Are they things that you could pick up on uh, Amazon or something? He's also considered like the father of steampunk. Because oh, really? he started writing about a steampunk investigator called St. Ives, I believe, if I remember correctly, it's been a while. And he, he has a whole series of books and short stories about him. Okay, okay, that sounds, that sounds interesting. I'll have to look into that. And, but there's uh, a lot of video games whose worlds I like walking around in. You know, Skyrim, of course, was just gorgeous. I'm one of the few people who liked cyberpunk. I thought it was a great environment. You Wait, it's really? Cyberpunk you, 2044. I thought everybody liked that. I guess I'm stupid. But, but a lot I, of people hate it because it didn't live up to what it promised, but I thought it was fine. What would you say if you had to pick like maybe like what were like the three best video games of all time? You know, I've been thinking about that recently. It's a difficult question because I for instance, I would put Doom up there. But Doom doesn't really hold up today, but it was really influential on me in particular. So much fun back in the uh, day. I, Gunfire yeah. Reborn is one of my favorites. That's a game out of Hong Kong by a team I know nothing about. It's a newer game. I think it came out a year ago. It is so well made and so fun. It's a first person shooter roguelite. That's just mm -hmm. amazing. I We just beat I, the final difficulty of that this week. Oh, wow. I see that good for you, like that you're able to keep up with it. Once things, when once, Things went from 2D to 3D in the 90s. I kind of was out because outside of Mario Kart, I got very discombobulated. And then I, I didn't play video games and I haven't for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden I found out that 2D's back and I was it so is back. I'm 2D so mad. Pixel graphics are back. I, I'm so mad. I'm like, what, when did this happen? I, I just remembered, you know, I loved the, I mean, I, I played, I was five years old when I played Super Mario Brothers in an arcade. And I remember being blown out by that. And I just was, I was a Castlevania kid, loved it. And then once it went 
three it went 3d i was just like mm, i'm gonna throw up i couldn't handle oh, it. seven days to die is up there also what's that one it's a zombie survival game but what i really like about it is the multiplayer it and it plays like a, a traditional role-playing game kind of but the computer's the gm it's an open world zombie apocalypse game with crafting oh wow it, it, it's so well done and every update just makes it better and better that's and I a play cool that, idea. I actually play that with Daniel Jellin, who's one of the other early magic artists. So now oh we're playing God. grounded for a while. Do, do you guys like so you hopefully there's you guys are protecting each other from the uh, zombie hordes? Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it, it's a great time. I, I enjoy that more than I enjoyed pen and paper role playing games. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I love the idea of the whole like the GM being something that's at the computer because that certainly takes away from, say, some of the like po politics or maybe like uh, the ostentatious nature of some of the dms that i've seen yeah i've had some bad i was mostly the dm back in the day but well, i could see you being a good dm though because you seem very to the point and not you know and you're actually good at creating worlds you know what i'm saying it was fun i enjoyed it a lot I, in fact, I had a haunted castle with 200 fully described locations in it that Wizards was going to publish and then Magic hit. And all of our attention was taken elsewhere. But it was that close to getting published. And so what happened to all those designs? Are they just... It's just hanging around. Are they owned they, by I, Wizards or, they, or did no, you... No, they're owned by me. Wow, you should... I don't, uh... I don't sign the rights to my stuff away easily. I, well, yeah, I'd, I'd that's imagine why I that. kept the rights to all my magic art as well. Well, I mean, it's it's not every day that somebody is both a talented artist and a shrewd business person because it's not something that they teach people how to be. You know, like even if you go to school for art, or like for instance, my father's a physician. They go to you go to med school for you know X years. They don't teach you how to become a medical business. They just teach you about the body, and it seems kind of odd that they don't teach people how to you know enter into business. Yeah, I, I didn't get the skills I have in order to enrich shareholders or suits. I just didn't. I don't mind doing it as an afterthought, but I come first when it comes it, to that. How did you become, How do, at such a young age, you seem to be aware of it at a time where, you know, there wasn't like an easy way of like, you know, the internet wasn't around. You could get that information so quickly. I Who learned taught it you the that? hard way. I learned it by making mistakes. But <laughs> I, to be honest, like about not giving up your rights, Again, Preston Wadley, the, the teacher that we had at Cornish, he would bring in his friends who were also artists, and, and one of them really stressed that. He, okay. he really stressed not to be taken advantage of, because they will try. So this guy really was an incredible professor, because he actually, he did it, he took, he, he took the time to actually teach. Oh, he was something. amazing. Like I said, he, he was one of the ones who didn't know there was this fantasy art industry. He said, I don't think this industry's out there, but I'm going to teach you how to do it either way. So, and he, he taught really, really well. I still, in my head, quote him every day when I'm painting. That's amazing. Did you ever get a chance to tell him that, uh, that you thought? I have. You know, that's no, I don't great. think I could ever thank him properly. I mean, right. he did yeah. a fantastic job. He's just sort of made you, he helped mold the person you are. Yeah, probably my most influential instructor. That's touching. That's great. Um, well, I, I guess that's a great note to end it on. But um, just to be just to be sure, is there anything else that you would like to talk about that you're working on? I love I love hearing your ideas. It's a uh, it's a blast. Not at the moment. I'm pretty much just concentrating on painting at the moment, mostly commissions. And if people want to get in touch with you to do that, how would they do that? They would do that through my wife at julie m at isomedia.com i don't i i've sort of isolated myself for a while like the, the political situation as it is has sort of turned me off of humanity and so i've gone into hiding more or less yeah things are pretty divisive would be a light way of describing it like i have a facebook account but i'll only drop in to post artwork or well, i i promoted your julie barrow video there last night I really? Oh my God! Yeah. I didn't see that. Oh my God! I, I, I oh, oh, jeez. Sixty-one people who said they they really liked it. I, 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 uh, you know, I am such a luddite. Like, I, you wouldn't have, you have no idea how much of a struggle it is for me because I'm, I'm, I'm almost forty, and so like having to post everything on the different pages, like I will forget that I didn't post one, and I'm like, uh, it's, 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 it's an, it's, it's an embarrassment, and I can't believe that I got the 
<laughs> the yes premiere for to, to, and I didn't even know about it. But hearing it from you now, this is I'm a schmuck. <laughs> Don't give it a second thought. I'm 56, oh, so you know. I'm I'll be giving it. A, I'll be giving it a second and third and fourth and fifth thought. Let's be like, oh, ah. I did start gaming in 1979. Wait, like you? Okay, there you go. At least you had that going. Was it done? I've been video gaming since Pong. Pong was what? Nineteen seventy something? Was it eighty? Seventy four, I think. You know, Pong's kind of cool. Even now, it's still fun. Like I could see it. It's just it's it's got like the element of good game. Like I guess good games don't really age. I don't think, right? They don't. And. You know, they're remaking a lot of the older games now just to up the graphics and sound quality, that sort Mm -hmm. of thing. Right on. Exactly. Well, it's been fantastic. I thank you so much for your time. And I I look look forward to uh, to uh, doing your to to, to your video coming out. It's really excited. And, uh, you know, it's our first like specific showcase of Artist Proof Artists. So I'm excited. It's like outside of, I'd say, you know, like uh, between you and Richard Garfield, you guys are like the granddaddies of the, of the game of magic. And it's, it's, he it's, is, he's such a cool guy. I, you know, it, he is a cool guy, but you know what? Like birds of a feather, you two are cool. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's just really cool to have gotten a chance to talk to you. And I appreciate it so much. It really has been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Vince, better known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. And how awesome was that interview Jesper Mirfus did with Alpa Markov, that vampire daddy. Piss him f***ing milk me daddy because I'm 21 years old and bugger bollocks biscuit. Tribal players are stupid c***s and... Oh, stop it. Oh, come on. Do you know how difficult it is to maintain another person's form? Well, I hoped everyone enjoyed the interview with Jesper as well as my impeccable impressions, which I am sure you'll let me know about in the comments. Anyway, we got cool stuff on the horizon, so keep on liking and subscribing, and until next time, I got a scoop.